Taxpayer Alert. I'm Al Segala. I'll be your moderator. I'm also president with the Calaveras County Taxpayer Association. And we've been doing this a couple of years, and we've got some of the smartest people in the county, all the supervisors, department heads, and this is no exception. We've got the superintendent of public instruction for Calaveras County. Scott Nanick, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Al. And uh, one of the things that um, uh, we'd like to do is let, have people feel more comfortable about you. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts and backgrounds? And Sure. I've been in public education now for almost 20 years, uh, most of that with the Calaveras County Office of Education. Um, I moved up into the area, let's see, going on 28 years ago today. Um, with uh, When I had my first daughter in the Bay Area, we decided that we wanted a quieter lifestyle. And so excited to be in Calaveras County. I uh, raised both my children here. They both went through uh, the public education system here in the county, and my wife is also a teacher in the county. Now, do they speak more better English? Yes, they Good. do more better, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> now, you used to be in Toastmasters, if I remember, in, yeah. the, in the dim, dark past. Way back when, thanks to Toastmasters, that, you know, that was a great organization and really helped hone my skills because in education, that's all we're doing is talking and presenting right? all the time. And also listening. Yes, lots of listening. That's what I learned about Toastmasters. Yeah. We were in Toastmasters class over 20 years ago in, uh, in Tuolumne County. And I remember Scott, and he was really a, a wonderful person then. And I don't think he's changed. He's still a wonderful person. And so um, uh, uh, looking ahead, uh, what do you see... Uh, for yourself in, in public education, do you, do you want to remain a superintendent, or do you, do you, would you want to be at the state level? Or I mean, I like being a local superintendent. I really like having my touch on what's happening in our local community because that's where I think I can make the biggest difference. That said, I also am involved at the state level, so I do sit on the FICMAT board, which is the financial crisis management uh, team uh -oh. uh, that's appointed by the state. So I sit on that as a representative for our region, our five-county area. Right. Um, and I do that part of SESA, which is the County Superintendents Association. Okay. So I, I have my pulse in the state level uh, findings of what's going on. I see. Um, what do you think is the major challenge for public education in our county? In our county, I think it's enrollment. Okay. Uh, which relates to money. Uh, but that is a big challenge both here and statewide. We are losing students on a statewide basis. So the whole state's feeling that enrollment issue, which relates to funding. And I think our funding model in California, while it just went through a whole change, isn't adequate uh, to represent our kids the way we think they should be. I see. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that has been a question with taxpayers uh, is CalPERS. And I think you have something called Cal. Cal Sturs. Cal Sturs. Yes. And uh, it, I understand there's problems with unfunded liability. Are you, are you familiar with that? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's a big topic in education on both sides. Yeah. Um, because both the employee and the employer have had to make large additional contributions um, to get it to balance. Yeah. And so employers are putting in as much as 20%. Um, employee costs went up a couple of percentages. So everybody's kind of sharing in that. Right. Um, I think it's important that the taxpayers understand on the uh, teacher's side, the Cal Stir side, <clears throat> they lose their eligibility for Social Security. Um, so if they've been in the private sector, that disappears. We're one of the few states that still does that. It's not so on the Cal Per side, which okay. is the more the classified side typically. So that means that um, their, their, their retirement is not supplemented by Social Security. Is that correct? Correct. I mean... If some of them have made their number of quarters, they might get a small Social Security check, um, but it's not going to pay for much. And, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So um, enrollment's down over 6% in the last five years, I understand? Yes. And, and, uh, and it's down over 16% since October 2002, yep. which is about 1,000 students. About 1,000 students, yeah. And it doesn't seem to be any, any end in sight. No, it, there doesn't. Um, unfortunately, we're in an, what I would call an aging county. Um, not so much aging, but we're attracting aging um, residents. So as that happens, they don't bring families in. Right. And without a growth in our economic footprint and our economic status, no jobs, no families. Well, uh, I'm 78 years old. I guess that would put me in the aging part of it. Now, does this mean that I should be encouraged to have children? Um, <laughs> that's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, on funding, uh, California has fallen from number five all the way down to 43 in spending per student. Per student. Now, I, I assume that's over the United States. Correct. Okay. Compared to all other states. Yeah. There was a time um, 15 years ago or so, California was number five ranked for pure pupil spending in the right. nation. I heard it was high. It was high. We had great programs going. The schools were well-funded. Um, but that's come down and down and down over the years. And now that we're dropping in to the 43, 45 range, depending on who, who you ask. And that is just disappointing for our students. Right. Um, and unfortunately, that pattern is hard to change. When you lose that much money out of education, and we really didn't lose it, what happened is we didn't grow with things as they changed. We oh. didn't keep adding funding to education. Um, the state felt there were other priorities, but I think it's time now we need to really look at how do we get us back to being in that top 10? Okay, what uh, of the, in education, what percentage of the education is public and, or, and what percentage is private? I don't know that number off the top of my head, but I'm gonna say the great majority is gonna be public. I think so. Huh? Um, I would say probably up in the 90s percentages, right. if I had to guess. Um, the other thing is that you, people need to know that Charter schools, most of them are public schools. Right. So when we're talking what's not public schools, we're talking a very small portion of just private individual schools. Now, I understand that charter schools have some leeway when it comes to state regulations and they're more flexible. Is that the reason why somebody wanted a charter school? That was originally the reason. That <laughs> is changing in California. Um, and I think it is changing overall for the better. Um, we operate a charter school, Mountain Oaks, here in the county. Uh, and they work hard to hold themselves to the same standards as every other school in the county. So I give them lots of credit for their approach. They hire only credentialed teachers. They pay them the same type of um, salary structure. They keep it really kind of balanced so that they aren't different. Even though they, the EDCO provides for some of those options, we don't think that builds good relationships. We think everybody should be on the same playing field. Okay, so... They would be part of the uh, CalSTRS system as well? Yes, they are. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> they're the same as the public school, except what regulations don't they, are, they, are they not they required had, to follow? They had some flexibility on hiring non-credentialed people to teach classes. Okay. Um, they, that's the biggest one. There is small, small, smaller flexibilities in there, but that's, that's the big one that stands out for everybody. It, and by not hiring credential teachers, they don't have to follow all the egg codes and regulations around teachers and their rights. Okay, so in hiring a non-credential teacher, um, it's basically a contract between the school and the teacher, mm -hmm. and there's no set requirements of what they should be paid or, or, or benefits or anything like or that. Or how much experience they've had, or what type of experience they okay. had, or how they validate that they are capable of teaching a student. Okay, um, some, I don't think it's very much in California, but some areas, I think Mo Milwaukee and some other ones have uh, voucher systems whereby, um, um, particularly in inner cities, schools that are doing poorly, the parents can opt to pull their kid out of public school, put in private school and have a voucher mm -hmm. of the amount of money that would be spent as if they went to public school, but it'll go to a private school. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently it's successful. Have you, do you have any information on that? 
Um, vouchers have been looked at, and I'm still kind of one way or the other. I'm not. I'm kind of in the middle on the road on the voucher right. system. I think parents inadvertent indirectly have voucher systems based on where they choose to locate. Right, they can pick a school in a better, better neighborhood. and move to them. I get it in the cities because they're close, they're overlapping districts, um, and some of them haven't performed. I think here in Calaveras County, our districts are extremely focused on providing the best education they can for students. Well, you got a good superintendent. That's what yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and lots of other superintendents. So. When we're covering the superintendency, my job primarily as county superintendent right. is to oversee the fiscal stability of the districts right. and their academic progress. So, um, those are my primary jobs. So each district also has their own superintendent locally right. uh, that works with their governing board to, do, to deal with the culture of their school and the focus of their school and those type of matters. Then, then on top of that, you have a principal right. of each school. Right. So a school would have a principal, its own superintendent, and then the county superintendent? Correct. Okay. So you have a principal who's your day-to-day -day guy making sure the kids are safe, everything's going on, uh, everybody's playing nice in the pond, the kids are learning. Right. Uh, we refer to principals today as instructional leaders. Um, their, their job is to really help coach their teachers on how to be better teachers. Um, and then the superintendent, normally over several schools, uh, their job is fiscal. Okay. Uh, you know, the facility, the operations, does the budget match in, the, in that role? And okay. then my role is to make sure that they stay within their budget and that they can pay their bills and their teachers at the end of the day. And, and also, I think you mentioned that uh, the quality, in other words, the, what the kids learn, um, you'll be concerned with. You, you want the kids, when they graduate, to actually know something. Absolutely. Um, okay. We have some great statistics on our kids and where they go. Uh, and I work with every school district on what we call the LCAP today, which is the Local Control Accountability Plan. Each district puts one of those plans together that says basically how they're going to spend their state revenue money, right. and then that plan comes to us, and we work with them throughout the year in that plan and designing it and building it and ensuring that they're meeting the needs of all their students. And then we approve that plan um, in the end. Okay, so... Um is there an evaluation as to what the kids learn? In other words, <clears throat> do uh, some kids in some schools uh, are better qualified to to live in, in, in our society than others because they're they're more uh, comfortable with the skills they need. For instance, balancing a checkbook, uh, need some knowledge of credit, they need to know something about history, um, they need to know something about uh, uh, the structure of government, and even what kind of government they have. Right. You know, uh, all these things kind of put together would be like a whole a whole person in a free society being able to chart their own life. Right. And plan for their own future. It's that basis foundation for them. So the California state standards drive what the schools teach. Okay. And a lot of that focus is on English language arts and on mathematics. Okay. Um, they also have to do sciences and they have to do social studies so they get that well-rounded education. But the, the measurement of assessment right now is currently English language arts and math in the state. The California school dashboard, which every school has one, so okay. I encourage viewers to go out and look for, if they just Google California school dashboard, they can put in the name of their school and it will show them how they're performing. Okay, now do you have your pencil? California school dashboard. California School Dashboard. Write it down because now you're going to find out more. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that dashboard is based on a growth model and an improvement model for schools. So we, it's based on how they did over the year previous year. And that's what we're looking for is they're making improvement, they're tweaking their programs, they're constantly growing because that's what we want out of individuals. They're constantly learning and growing and picking up new skills. Right. And so the dashboard right now heavily focused, like I said, on language arts, English, and mathematics. Science is the next one being rolled into that. Um, but it also covers things like attendance, discipline rates, um, how they're dealing with foster youth and homeless children, how they're dealing with English language learners. All of that's kind of in this dashboard. And once you take a peek at it, it'll become clear really quick. I'm going to do that. That sounds interesting. Yep. Um, one of the things that, that occurred to me 
is that the human mind um, is extremely valuable. And I think that there was a figure of $4 billion to try to, to approximate it using computers. And even then, with the $4 billion expenditure, it still wouldn't quite do it. So here we have human beings running around with this $4 billion computer. Now, if you buy a computer, you get uh, what's called an owner's manual. It tells you how it works. And I was thinking, well, uh, it seemed like young people, maybe old people too, need to have the manual for their mind to understand how it works and how to control their own emotions, how to set their own goals, and how to plan, you know, all the basic things that the mind does. Mm -hmm. um, if, they, if they had that, then they'd be more successful versus if they didn't have that. Um, as an example, um, if there's um, a problem, uh, the, the first, sometimes the first reaction is to blame somebody else. Um, he did. He made me mad. She made me mad. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, but it, to be successful, that some, usually that doesn't work. Right. Uh, usually you have to take accountability, which means you have to control your own emotions, and and and, and create the outcome you want you want to have. Mm -hmm. And it's it takes. Uh, not only study but practice to do that. Right. And I just wanted have the schools ventured into this area at all, psychology? Um, some. Um, so some schools, especially at the younger levels, have adopted what's called a practice of mindfulness. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So mindfulness um, teaches the kids how to center on themselves and be aware of themselves. Mm -hmm. But on the broader picture, I think we teach that to kids by making them work on projects and in groups because our employers today want to see somebody who can function in a group. Right. And part of all those things you talked about means that you can be self-aware in a group, you can function in a group, you can know you're not going to agree but be respectful right. and get your point across. Right. That's what our employers are really pushing us to provide them. They say if we can find them somebody that will show up, somebody that can work in a group, they got an employee. They'll take it from there. So if they're willing to learn, um, our employers are really happy when they find somebody that, that can do those skills. A trustworthy person. Yes. And which, of course, that segues into another thing. Uh, trustworthy, that, that's ethics and morality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the schools can't get into religion because right. you, you nope. take one religion over another, you're, you're going to have all kinds of problems. And, and our founders knew that, and they, they, they provided... Um, that uh, the there should not be a mix of state and and church, and, right? And so, however, that doesn't mean an absence of morality. No, absolutely not. Yeah. I think ethics and morality are an important part of education. Right. Um, we do that through things like plagiarism and not using that. Um, those are those are lessons that are taught almost daily in classrooms today. That you're making a decision on which way you go, which way you act how you behave, how you respond to somebody, um, being true to yourself, right. um, be, but being true to the process, right. um, giving credit where credit is due. Right. Those are important things that I think they learn that through the classroom every day. I found that I seem to be most successful when I take myself not too seriously. Yeah. Gotta have fun too. <laughs> Life's too short not to enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, it's been said that the basic morality is uh, summed up of, uh, as uh, um, honor your agreements and respect the rights of others. Mm -hmm. Just like two basic things. And then rights of others, there's the fundamental rights that are shown in our Constitution, right. which are life, liberty, and property. Yep. Pursuit of happiness is a function of liberty, not, not a fundamental right. right. But anyway, so uh, uh, I think the taxpayers... Are, are really happy with what you're doing. And, and uh, they, uh, they or are, are, are we, uh, want to get the most for our buck, but most importantly, we want the new generation come, coming out to know um, about their country, to, mm -hmm. to know how to uh, how know their own mind, and to have the basic tools of math and, and um, English and such to, to be able to be successful. Right. And, uh, so, uh, as we move ahead here, uh, you have uh, a new project 
career-directed education. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So there's a group of us that were concerned that we were being becoming too focused on going to universities. Right. That we were losing the trades, that we were losing other aspects of that hands-on learning. And so we, we came up with this idea of career-directed education. So it's myself, the two high school superintendents, Mark Campbell and Mike Chimini, okay. um, with me, and then some community members and some economic development folks talking about how do we spur kids into interested in real careers. There is no reason today for a student to spend $100,000 in debt to get a degree right. and come out and not have a job. Right. When they can earn that much money in two years through a certificate program, through some other training program, and if they want to continue their education, they can f self fund it along the way. Right. And that's what we want kids to be able to do because I'm looking down the road and I pay enough for a plumber right now. What I'm going to pay in 10 years scares me. Yeah. And so we really want kids to be exposed to those. And that's some of the challenges being rural is our kids are not exposed to manufacturing. They're not, not exposed really to the medical field other than a user. So how do we get them interested in those fields and move them on? So the career-directed education, we created, created a website, calaverascte.org. Calaverascte.org. You had your pencil, and you can write it down, and this is one you want to check out. So we've interviewed several people from around the country, so there's a whole set of podcasts up there, on career-directed education and career tech education. And that's an important part. So we're going to be doing speakers from all over the industries on the high school campuses. We're in the process of setting up so we can, being it kind of where we're split county, it makes it hard for speakers to dedicate that time because they volunteer it. Right. And so we're setting up a video stream between the two campuses. So we'll be able to have a speaker come in and talk to one group and stream it to the other campus and then turn around to do the reverse the next time. So the kids get exposed to the medical field, the advanced manufacturing field, the, um, the importance of IT today and how it's changing with AI and everything else. We want our kids exposed to that and excited to move into those careers. Uh, AI is... Uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Boy, it shows you how, how old I am. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> artificial intelligence, $4 billion mine. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying. They haven't got it yet. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, there uh, are there other uh, things that are going on that the schools or the kids are doing that would be a good idea to let the public know about? Um, I think I'm always amazed. I visit every campus in our county at least twice a year, once in the fall and once in the spring. Right. And so I get to see the hands-on things they're doing and the kids. And there's some great teaching going on out there in our county. And I think we should be proud of what we're providing to our students. It's a challenge under the new testing environment to really show super performing test scores. Um, so our test scores lag a little bit. I, I get that and I want our, our focus on improving and that growth model that we talked about. Um, but our kids are doing well. They're going off to universities, they're going off to trade schools, they're going off to junior colleges. Um, many of our students, half the county is eligible for free Columbia College um, as the Promise Scholarship through their foundation. And so um, that follows the Columbia College footprint right now. Yeah. But I'm working with them to try to expand that footprint countywide so that any student in our county could go to Columbia the first year for free. Okay, so which ones can go to Columbia now? Right now, anybody um, in the Bret Hart area footprint. Okay, but not Calaveras? Not Calaveras yet, because Columbia is, that's where the border is for the Columbia College District. Right. And the other one falls into Delta. So we're, we're, we're working with Delta to see if they can come up with something similar. Columbia raised millions of dollars to get this to go and wow. uh, as a commitment to our youth. Now, uh, this money that was raised to for these scholarships, uh, did that come from, where did that come from? Um, private donors. All right. Yeah. People stepping up saying kids' education is important. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that half the... Uh, Half our kids uh, don't get the scholarships to go to college. Yeah, there there are other ones out there, but this is an easy one. You just yeah. show up at Columbia and say, "I want my first year free." You got warm blood, you, you know, right. and um, well, they have to get, they have to have entrance exams, don't they? Not for Columbia College. 
So oh, yeah. community colleges will take anybody who walks through the door um, that as long as they're 18. And it's they place them and, and figure out what their academic levels are, right. um, but they, they don't have to qualify to go in. And so that route is an excellent route for anybody, even if they plan on going to a university, because you can get your first two years and all that undergraduate you know, stuff that's just grunt work to get it done. Right. Um, you can get that done at a very low cost. And then you're guaranteed transfer to any of the state um, universities or state colleges. From Columbia. For, from Columbia or any junior college in, or community college okay. in the state. So there's lots of options out there for students. Um, and exposing them to what they are is the key. Okay. Out of 100 kids uh, that get to the senior year, um, roughly how many go on to college? So um, about 60% go to a junior college or a trade school, and then about 24% go to a four-year, and the rest either enter the workforce, go into the military, or are still trying to figure it out. Okay. And so the still trying to figure it out, so we say go and roll. Figure it out there. Keep moving forward. Keep getting skills. Yeah, the last thing you want to do as being an employee for anybody today is not to continue to grow. The world changes too fast. Yeah, and I don't think an employer would want somebody who's there to, to camp out. Right. No. <laughs> Got to produce. That's the yeah. name of business. Um, what is uh, some of the, I understand that some, sometimes the kids uh, do outreach in the community. They, they work uh, on projects. Mm -hmm. And do you have any, much of that going on now? Yeah, our kids are always involved in projects. So both high schools offer in their senior year, it's almost an expectation that students get involved. Um, so they do community service projects, they do fundraising. The flagpole in front of our office was put up by a Boy Scout through one of his projects. Um, those things are great to see and gets the kids out in the community because especially in our community where we tend to be a little older, they don't see kids in the same realm as parents do that right. are active with their kids in high school or below. So getting them out in the community is always good. One of the other things we've started that's excited this year is we have a pilot program with county government where we have about six kids right now doing internships at county government oh, good. to expose them to county government jobs in hopes they will decide to stay there because yeah. they have the same problem we do. Finding good employees is hard. Right, right, <clears throat> true. Our, our taxpayer group is promoting the Constitution, and we have a little booklet and we're hoping to reach uh, high school students. Yep. We think we need to bribe them. I hate to say that, but we're hoping to raise like $10,000 for really good prizes for taking a quiz. Yep. If we can, if we can do that, we might have a lot of kids Absolutely. knowing the Constitution, and that would be wonderful. They do get it, you know, from junior li um, level in high school up. Those two years get hit with the Constitution, pretty good. So they have a good working knowledge. But I don't think most of them have sat down and really studied it. I love the quiz idea yeah. and uh, and getting our kids involved. And there's a lot of distractions out there. Yeah, I know. So money's always girls, a good one to focus. Girls, girls too. Oh, well, boys. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I remember when I was a kid, that it's pretty hard to, to uh, keep your mind where it ought to be. Right. Um, so as we move ahead, is there anything that you'd like to say to, uh, to the public? Um, keep schools in your mind. Okay. Stay focused. My doors are always open. Um, I, I have always had an open door policy. So they're free. Stop in my office. I do run a pretty busy schedule, but my secretary, Lisa, would be glad to set up an appointment. I'm there to talk and share and, and educate. So, thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Scott Nanick, Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you.